so cool. And that's why you've, I've heard you say before, this is why many baptismal fonts have eight sides to it. Yeah, you'll see that oftentimes, eight-sided baptismal font, uh, to, to show the reality that what God did in the Old Testament, he has brought to fulfillment now. Just as he sa saved eight in all in the Old Testament, so he saves you on the eighth day. Do you see? So these mm. beautiful images of manna, of, of the crossing of the, of, the, of the Red Sea, all of these things are a prefigurement of what Jesus is going to do in the fullness of time to give us back. And again, I go back to that thing about the, free, the, the same one acting. It is the same one acting in paradise. It is the same one acting throughout the Old Testament. It is the same acting in the New Testament. And therefore, there is no conflict or discontinuity or a divorce or, or maybe worse, I would say, an invention. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus is not here to put a band-aid on the wound that the devil inflicted on us. No, he's come to heal us and restore us to God's original plan. I'm going to share with you some beautiful words from Cardinal Jean Danielou on this whole, the importance of this, this um, idea of typology. He begins, he says, that the realities of the Old Testament are figures of those of the New is one of the principles of biblical theology. The science is of the sim similitudes between the two Testaments is called typology. And he goes on. Uh, the Gospel of John shows us that the manna was a figure of the Eucharist. The first epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians, that the cross in the Red Sea was a figure of baptism. The first epistle of St. Peter, that the flood was a figure of baptism. This means further, and here's where it gets important for us, as we're looking at the Eucharist today with Dr. Kenneth Howell, who's going to join us in just a few minutes. He says, the sacraments carry on in our midst the great works of God in the Old Testament and in the New. For example, the flood, the passion, the passion of Christ, and, bap and our baptism show us the same divine activity as carried out in three different eras of sacred history. And these phases of God's actions are all ordered to the judgment at the end of time. Uh, how beautiful that is then, to realize that the same reality taking place in your baptism that same reality of God's saving action. When, 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 when Cardinal Jean Daniel says that, let's, I'm going to read that one line again. So, it's so important. He says, all of these things, the flood, the passion, the baptism, show us the same divine activity. Well, what is the same divine activity? It is the one who has one activity, and that is love, right? God is love, right. John says. And love seeks to sit, share his life with the beloved. And therefore, in every saving act in the Old Testament and the New, it is God who is love who is intervening in, man, in man's life. Um, and, uh, and, and, and because of that, then, we have a communion with those who have gone before us and can participate in the reality. You ever want to, do you ever want, what would you pay to have seen the crossing of the Red Sea? Oh, I know, it's, man. It, St. Paul says you have a chance to see it every time, Annie. Every time there's a baptism in your church, you get to see the full fulfillment. You get to see the crossing of the Red Sea and more. Do you see? It, wow. and, and how important this is from a catechetical standpoint of learning how, how we are to approach the holy mysteries. Think about what it was like for Pharaoh and the Egyptians become charging out of Egypt, chasing the Israelites on the edge of the Dead Sea, uh, the, the Red Sea, and for Moses to have struck the sea and parted the waters and said, walk. Now, most of us, you know, maybe we've got the movies in our mind and things like that. We don't, don't realize when, when the waters were parted, these walls of water were, 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 were separated. Yeah. The distance from one side of the sea to the other would have caused our, uh, your eye to see the waters closed. They wouldn't have seen the other side open. Wow. And so they would have had to be in complete faith. That's why St. Paul says they were to be baptized into Moses in that moment, plunged into Moses. And he says, walk, and they walked. That's the kind of faith that the church asks us for. That's the kind of faith that we need when we approach the holy mystery of baptism in our churches. Yeah. And it saves us from the slavery of sin we we cross that yeah. red sea away from egypt no He's, more are we no more are we being freed just from slavery to pharaoh and the egyptians but we exactly we're being slaved we're being saved from sort of slavery to sin so god did this intentionally as to prepare us for the fullness of life which he's going to give us in the New Testament and even fuller in the fullness of the sacraments which are given to us in the church. As we look at the Eucharist today with Dr. Kenneth Howe, we're going to be looking at this beautiful reality of God's consistent action toward mankind, the same divine activity. The Eucharist is not something invented and new. 
It is a reality prepared for us from all eternity. It is God made present as he wanted to be present to our first parents in paradise. So we're looking forward today. We're going to be with Dr. Kenneth Howell on this beautiful feast of Corpus Christi. Some of our dioceses celebrating this feast in this coming Sunday in these days of the feast, looking at the Eucharist in salvation history. So we're going to be, we're going to hit a break here in a moment. Coming up, Dr. Kenneth Howell will join us to discuss the Eucharist on this Corpus Christi Thursday. You're listening to Face to Face with the Institute of Catholic Culture on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Stay with us. Your odyssey begins at the University of Dallas, the premier Catholic liberal arts university in Texas. With campuses in Irving and Italy, UD's rigorous core curriculum sets it apart. An education rooted in the great works of Catholic and Western tradition. An education that ennobles and enables students in the pursuit of wisdom, truth, and virtue. Undergraduate, graduate, and certificate programs are available. Start your college odyssey at the University of Dallas today. Go to udallas.edu to learn more. I had known about the station for a long time, but I have to confess, I never tuned in. Perhaps I was biased, but then that changed, actually. Once I started listening, I, I, I kept the dial uh, where it was at. I like Teresa Tamio and Al Crest, and I just like their personalities. Call the Communion with Dr. David Anders and uh, Mortal Life with the Pop Checks. I really, really love the show. I learned a lot. But you know, also, I, I really like there's prayers interspersed. I get a lot more praying done in the day that I wouldn't otherwise. We want to support the radio station for sure. The Guadalupe Radio Network, Catholic Radio, radio for your soul. Welcome back to Face to Face with the Institute of Catholic Culture on the Guadalupe Radio Network. I'm Father Hezekiah Carnazzo, Annie Mitchell's with me, and I do believe we've got Dr. Kenneth Howell on the line. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you very much, Father. It's wonderful to be with you. Good to have you. Good to have you with us. We're so excited. Dr. Howell is the president of the Pontifical Studies Foundation uh, and academic director of the Eucharist Project. His most recent book is called Mystery of the Altar, Daily Meditations on the Eucharist, uh, published by Emmaus Road Publishing. He's also given several lectures on the Church Fathers as well as the Eucharist for the ICC, for the Institute of Catholic Culture. You can go to our... Um, our, our show notes on our page, Annie, I believe it's iccradio.org, yeah? That's right, and you can go to iccradio.org and uh, check that out. Sorry, um, I muted myself, yes, I have this go. all linked at iccradio.org. We're, we're going to be jumping here to talk with Dr. Hal about the Feast of Corpus Christi, but I do believe our participants today can jump on and join the conversation. Most definitely. If you have a question about the Eucharist today, call 877-757-9424 with your questions. That's 877-757-9424. Dr. Howell, I, I took a, uh, a moment there, read, read your bio, um, shared that with, with our listeners, but it's not the whole story. You were uh, a Protestant minister, I believe, yeah, I, for, for 20 years. Is that right? Uh, yeah, for 18. Yeah, that's right. For 18 years, tell, just tell me very quickly in the nutshell. You know, the 30 seconds or less version. What? Uh, t tell us about your conversion, a little bit about your history, your story. Well, as you say, I was a Presbyterian minister, but I was teaching in a Presbyterian seminary, and it was during that time that I began reading the Church Fathers pretty extensively. And the more that I read them, especially on the Eucharist, I came to the realization that my uh, Generally, Protestant, but particularly Presbyterian faith, was was deficient uh, because it's very clear in the Church Fathers that they believed wholeheartedly that the Eucharist, truly consecrated by a legitimate priest, is the body and blood of Christ. So I, following that up, I said, well, I, I've always promised the Lord I would follow the truth wherever it led me, so I'm going to have to uh, become a Catholic. Wow. So it was really the Eucharist which drew you in, huh? It drew you into to a, a restored communion with the church. Yeah, it was a, it was a multi-step process. I had to, you know, wrestle with some other things like the papacy and things like that. But and and particularly because I was a Protestant, um, with the question of justification and 
how grace and works go together or don't go together or whatever. And uh, <clears throat> But after I worked through those things, <clears throat> excuse me, the thing that grabbed my heart was the realization that God loved us so much. He loved me so much mm -hmm. that he would give me himself. Um, this day, as you mentioned, is the Feast of Corpus Christi. And um, the the encyclical by Pope Urban IV called Transitoris, which he instituted the feast, he says that how marvelous is this wonderful gift that the giver is given in the gift. Hmm. So it's not just a gift that God gives, but he gives himself as a gift. Uh, and so that's what drew me in. Yeah. You know, as, I, I, you, just, as you said that, I remember Jesus' own words, and no greater love has any man than to give his life for his friend. And uh, yeah. and there it is. God, who is love, gives Himself to us. Now, you um, recently published this book, uh, "Mystery of the Altar." Tell us a little bit about this book. What's in it? Um, in case some of our listeners want to want to pick up a copy. Well, I hope that I hope that everyone will want to use this book because I think it can really nourish and deepen their faith in Christ, specifically in His sacramental reality. Um, my friend, my co-author, Joseph Crownwood, and I um, combed 21 centuries of the church um, to find readings that would reflect uh, the depth and the breadth of the Lord's teaching on this. Um, so we have saints from every century of the church, um, from the first or second, at least, to the, to the 21st. Mm. So one thing that a person reading this on a daily basis will get is a, is a, is a deeper sense of the, how indebted we are to our forebears who have uh, kept this faith and passed it on to us. Now, the book is structured in six, 365 days of reading. We give a little introduction to the author uh, in each day for the reading. Um, and then we give a quotation from some writing uh, of him or her. Um, we have the great church fathers, perhaps the greatest uh, father in the Eucharist from St. John Chrysostom, uh, the Archbishop of Constantinople in the early 5th century. Uh, we have probably 10 or 11 readings from him. We have about the same from St. Augustine in the West. Um, we have readings from medieval women mystics. Uh, from other uh, from modern authors like Julie Neymar, uh, and these are all designed to um, grab us with a the faith. When we, when we see somebody else's faith, it tends to inspire our faith, yeah. and that's what we hope that this will do. Um, now, not every reading is going to grab everybody the same way, but a person that uses it consistently over time would, I think. Um, be deeply nourished in this. Uh, there's also an author index, author and source index. So if a person wanted to not follow day by day, but follow a particular author, uh, they could go. Most of the authors that are used here are used only once or twice. But as I said, there's a number of them that are used multiple times. Um, I particularly desire this to be in the hands of every English-speaking priest in the world because they're very vocation, their very calling is to minister at the altar. Mm. And so we hope that this will nourish their faith, and then by spiritual osmosis, as it were, uh, they will be able to convey that, that faith to others. That's, you know, a Annie uh, Mitchell over here has got a copy of your book in her hand, and it looks beautiful. I think it would be a, a nice a nice uh, 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 um, assistance to her prayer, daily prayer, almost to make a Eucharistic year, um, yeah. but also yeah. uh, as a gift for uh, priests, maybe for, for your pastor, so forth. So we're going to link this book um, on our on iccradio.org, the show notes for today. We're going to link this okay. book. If anybody wants to jump in here, you're welcome to come on. And uh, if you want to ask a question about the Eucharist, you want to talk to Dr. Uh, Howell about the Eucharist, share your thoughts, you're welcome to do so. Annie, I, I believe there's a phone number or on uh, even on social media. Yes, call 877-757-9424. Again, 877-757-9424. And we are monitoring social media 
social media feeds. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Annie. You know, uh, doctor, um, I want to go back. You mentioned that this book um, that, you, that, you've, that you've authored, Mystery of the Altar, really goes through uh, the centuries of insights from the church fathers to the present age. But, you know, as, 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 as I know you know, the insights of the church fathers don't stop with their own experience but oftentimes dive, dive deeply into a biblical background for the Eucharist. And, and I'd, so I'd like to ask you to just spend a few minutes with us to help us go back further to, to understand the Eucharist um, in, uh, in, in more in the context of salvation history. And I came across this, I was, I was doing a little bit of a study this morning, actually with Annie on her radio program, and, and we were looking at the, um, the biblical text that the church gives us this coming Sunday, and the response to psalm is Psalm 116. And in that psalm, we hear these words, To you will I offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. It struck me that literally the psalmist is saying, to you will I offer a Eucharistic sacrifice. And help us understand what this concept of the Eucharist in the Old Testament uh, and, and, and understanding what Jesus is doing in the greater context of salvation history. Well, I think that's a really relevant question, particularly to me, because I'm just on the verge of finishing up another book on St. John Chrysostom's Doctrine of the Eucharist. And uh, in, the, in, the third, in the second chapter, I talk about the way that he uh, talks about the Old Testament types and personages as being harbingers of the future Eucharist. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you know, obviously Moses is the, the great redeemer of Israel in the Old Testament. But in one of the passages, he talks about that Moses, meaning the Old Testament, and this Moses, meaning Jesus, and how he gives not just manna from heaven, but he gives himself as the bread of angels. Um, and so there's a, both a continuity and discontinuity. The continuity is that God was in all of the events and institutions of the Old Covenant was preparing his people not only for the coming of the Redeemer, but for the receiving of the Redeemer through the sacramental life of the Church. Mm. So when we are involved in the Divine Liturgy, or Mass, or whatever we call it, um, we are engaging in that same salvation history, where we're the recipients of that grace. Um, Mm. Another area where he and this is uh, in, his, in his treatise on the priesthood, which a lot of men training for the priesthood read. Um, in his treatise on the priesthood, which he wrote within the first year of his being ordained, um, he, talk, he, he talks about Elijah on Mount Carmel. And, Mount, you know, I remember this great sacrifice. Found the fire came down and, you know, consumed the sacrifice. And he's, he's uh, consciously hmm. drawing on the drama of what took place under with Elijah and how and I think he's sort of implicitly contrasting it with what looks like just an ordinary experience of our worship where uh, you know we have bread we have wine it looks like normal mm-hmm. stuff you know nothing special but what he wants us to see is the spiritual dynamism that's in the sacrament and that is conveyed through the sacrament to the believer so he says you know, move your eyes, your spiritual eyes, move your eyes from Elijah to this table and see that the priest is calling down not fire, but the Holy Spirit. This is referring to the epiclesis there. He's calling down the Holy Spirit. And in calling down the Holy Spirit, he is making this table, and he goes to say it, a table of spiritual fire. Mm-hmm. So he asks the question, don't you know that this table is full of spiritual fire? Wow. If we only understood, and if we only experienced the Eucharist in its fullness, we would see something much greater than ever took place in the Old Covenant. 
you know, doctors, you're talking is just so beautiful and similar in a similar vein to what I was speaking earlier about the crossing of the Red Sea and how the faith of Israel to walk through the opening of those waters to that what, what must have appeared as certain death to them. And yet they and, and so by understanding the biblical stories in the Old Testament, it enlightens and uh, uh, our understanding was given to us in the new and i think it, it can bring a, a great healing we're going to take a break here doctor you're going to i, I believe able to stay with us um to uh to, to uh, continue our conversation so please stay with us we'll be right back with kenneth howell to continue our discussion of the eucharist it's face to face with the institute of catholic culture stay with us Atheists assert the only real form of knowledge is scientific knowledge, thus excluding any sort of religious knowledge, whether philosophical or theological. Such a belief is called scientism, and it's unreasonable for two reasons. First, it's self-refuting. Its truth cannot be verified by the scientific method. It's a metaphysical proposition, and as such, is not scientific knowledge. But if science can't verify the truth of scientism, well then, scientism itself cannot be a legitimate form of knowledge, in which case, it's self-refuting. Moreover, scientism undermines science as a rational form of inquiry, because it denies presupposed philosophical assumptions that are necessary to even do science, such as, there's an external world outside the minds of scientists. So, to reject God's existence on the grounds that it's not scientific knowledge is simply unreasonable. I'm Carlo Broussard with the ready reason for Catholic Answers, Catholic.com. Welcome back to Face to Face with the Institute of Catholic Culture. Uh, good to have you back with us with Dr. Kenneth Howell. Remember, if you would like to learn more about what we're doing at the Institute, be sure to visit iccradio.org. Today we're talking and continuing a discussion now regarding the Eucharist, especially the Eucharist in salvation history. Dr. Howell was just sharing with us a beautiful, beautiful imagery from the Old Testament to help us understand what's taking place on the altar of our churches today. And we've got a couple calls, I do believe, Annie, coming in. And I think we got to take you off of mute again, Annie. Thank you. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. I'm Annie, so you're sorry. supposed to be the radio pro here. I'm supposed to be the radio pro here. What's <laughs> going on? We uh, we have a call from Catherine Houston. Catherine, well, go ahead. Well, welcome, Catherine. Go ahead. A beautiful conversation. And in our house, we've had several beautiful conversations with lots of you know, eloquent and historical and reverent um, discussions of this one question. My son, my eight-year-old, just received First Communion a few weeks ago, and he has been very happy. But his one question, I understand that it is the body and blood of Christ, but of all the things in this world, why did Jesus choose bread? That's a, it's a great question, Catherine, and congratulations, by the way, to your son. I will certainly keep him in, in your family in our prayers. Doctor, I'm going to hand Thank this right over, right over to you um, and, uh, and help us understand why would Jesus have chosen bread? Yeah, because, um, well, let's think about eating for just a second. It's a very primordial uh, human experience. Cultures differ across in the way people think and the language they speak and the cultural customs that they have. But every culture uh, has eating, and not only eating, actually every culture has feasting. And, and they, they see eating as part of the festivities of the joy of life. Um, so why did God give us a meal? He gave us a meal because he wanted to show us that in the same way that we ingest food and it becomes a part of our body, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's metabolized into our own body. In the same way, our souls are metabolized into Christ. And so the reason we receive the Eucharist as opposed to just believing on him, you know, I used to believe as a, as a evangelical Protestant, well, 
I mean, you have faith in Jesus, and that's how you're saved. Well, that's true, but that faith has to be um, brought to perfection by receiving Jesus himself into us. And we do that by receiving the, the sacrament of the Eucharist. Now, why did he choose bread? Because in many cultures, they don't have uh, chocolate. <laughs> they don't, they, maybe they don't have wine. Maybe they don't have uh, you know, various kinds of delicacies that we have. But every culture understands basically the idea of, of flour and, and bread. They understand eating and drinking. And uh, the church is showing us that we have to have Jesus inside of us. The way that I put it, you know, there's the famous statement of St. Saint, uh, Saint Cyprian of Carthage. He says, uh, there's no salvation outside the church. And in modern times, we've been, you know, wrestling with this question, well, can people who are not Catholic be saved? And the church generally answers, well, yes, it depends on, you know, the inner state of their heart. But without going into that in detail, there's a way to think of it this way, um, that to be saved, whether you're a baptized Catholic or not, not only must you be in the church in some sense, even mystical sense, but the church must be in you. It is what the church believes and stands for and communicates. And what it communicates is Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. So Jesus must be inside of us, and he must, as it were, permeate us. And so God gives us bread because the church is Catholic, and every culture understands that act of eating. Thank you, Dr. Go ahead, Catherine. Oh, I was going to say, that's lovely. And my son is nodding his head inside the band there. I stepped out to, to hear the call. Very He's nice. nodding his head listening. <laughs> Very nice. You know, there's yeah. another uh, another perspective that, uh, and, and Doctor, maybe you would like, maybe you want to comment, maybe you don't, but I've always, oftentimes think, thought that we, we oftentimes look at this in one direction, asking a similar question about why Jesus chose this or that uh, uh, form to give us the, the holy mysteries. But c- can we say in some way that br- that, that water was made for baptism. You know, we drink water, we have water in all aspects of our life, we're born from the womb. Uh, All of these are kind of natural preparations for the sacramental reality, but in some sense water finds its perfection fulfillment in what it does in the sacrament of baptism. Bread, in a similar sense, is made for it to be Eucharist. And in fact, in some ways we can say that in the restoration of all things, as the whole world is caused is 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 cr- created to be divinized, as it was meant to be in paradise, that truly bread was made for Eucharist. Yeah, no, that's beautiful, and that's very. I mean, I've seen that that very thing in the Church Fathers a number of times. So it's very consistent with, you know, the teaching of the Church through many many generations. But and I think another way to simply say that is that. We don't know all the uses of something, but God does. And he knew that there would be a sacramental use of that Mm. in the future. So he created it for that purpose. Mm. Very beautiful. Um, And Annie, I do believe we've got another caller coming in here from Pensacola, I believe. Anthony from Pensacola, yes? Well, I think we lost Anthony, but I know what he wanted to ask, which was uh, he was he was hoping that that we could address the the question of communion on the tongue and why that why that is a big deal. Um, That's an interesting question, and I have not been able to trace that down to my satisfaction. What we do know from historic documents is that um, communion has been both in the hand and on the tongue. I think, and I I express that I think, I don't know this for certain, um, that it's mainly in the early church, it was mainly on the hand. Now, we see that, for example, in the mystagogical uh, catechesis of St. Cyril of Jerusalem where he talks about how we receive Holy Communion. He talks about laying your right hand on your left hand and making a throne because you're going to receive the king. So very clearly there he's instructing people about receiving um, in one's hand. Um, When exactly um, 
we started receiving in the tongue, on the tongue, um, both in the East and in the West. Um, I don't know the exact uh, time of that. Um, I, I think there's two extremes to avoid here. One is uh, a sort of a careless, a casual uh, attitude where we just sort of prance up there and you know, receive the, the holy body and blood as if it's nothing unusual, nothing nothing uh, astounding, which it really is. Um, the other is to be a little bit too um, legalistic about it in the sense that we insist, that, oh, we can only have it on the tongue, you know, because that's the only right way to receive it. Now, I'm a Western writer, Roman writer, Christian, so, and I receive it only on the tongue. At my parish, I kneel down at the um, at the um, at the communion rail, and I receive it on the tongue. But there's many people that don't, and so I think we have to be uh, until the church were to determine something definitive on this matter. I think we have to allow for you know variations of people. Thank you, Doctor. We've got just a couple of minutes left before our next break. I don't know if you're able to stay with us beyond that break uh, for just mm-hmm. a couple of minutes. Would you be available, Doctor? Yes. Uh-huh. Excellent, excellent. So I want to just change, kind of turn our conversation a little bit um, because we oftentimes focus upon the Eucharist as that which is on the altar. And the consecration mm-hmm. is that which happens to the bread. And the transformation of this of of the of the bread into the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and the adoration that is then due to that to this reality, but oftentimes in this act, I think we we distance ourselves from the Eucharist, even in uh, the concept of how we receive it, um, and and so I'd like to just kind of turn the corner here for just a minute and ask you, in light of what takes place with the bread on the altar. How are we to mm-hmm. understand the Eucharist as received by us? What is it meant to do for us? Oh, that's <laughs> you, you've hit on the central question. Um, one of the beautiful things about uh, the Eastern traditions, and you know, right now I've spent a lot of time translating the Greek fathers um, on the Eucharist, it's very clear that in, in the fathers, in the Greek fathers, um, it's also in the West, but not quite as not quite as prominent, is the purpose of the Eucharist, the purpose of all the sacraments, is our deification or our divinization. In other words, we God so fills our lives and our hearts that we are our whole desire is to live with God forever. Uh, and then we're with God. In fact, we won't make it to heaven until we are divinized. Uh, now, some people misunderstand this because they sort of see this as being a new age, you know, a hocus pocus kind of a thing. But that's not the Christian idea of deification. It's not that we become gods, but it's that God's presence pervades our human nature and lifts it up to a higher and the highest level possible. And the reason this is necessary is to remember because God is the only uncreated entity that exists. Everything else is created. Angels, you know, souls, everything is created except God. God is the only self-sufficient being, which is why he said to Moses, I am who I am. I am what I am. And so God is the only... So in order to rise up to the level to be in union with God, he has to give us something we cannot have in our human nature. Even if we had never fallen into sin, we would still have to be divinized. And as you mentioned earlier, the whole creation is to be divinized and brought up to God, as a, and brought, so to speak, in God as a uh, eternal reality. It's, it's, it's almost, you know, I always go back to the image of the Garden of Eden, which I know that the fathers of the church love to go back to. And, um, and it's almost as though in, in the Eucharist at the altar, the seed of creation is planted again, filled with God's life. Yeah. He breathes once again into our nostrils. Uh, but then, but then w- what takes place on the altar is then to transform all those 
who receive communion. We receive communion, and I think often I don't think about what that word even means. We're made, we're made one with God in a similar way that that bread was just transformed on the altar. The community yeah. itself is to be transformed into a, a made one, a partaker of the divine nature with God himself. Am I thinking right, Doctor? Oh, absolutely. See, here's, this is one of the great puzzles. Uh, the almost uh, uh, grief that m- many of the church fathers feel, and I can point to one in the, in the West. Well, Doctor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold you up right there. I'm going to bring you back and to share that with us about the inside of the church father from you. We're with Dr. Kenneth Howell. We're going to take a short break here and come back and finish our conversation on the Eucharist on this beautiful day, the Feast of Corpus Christi. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Minute. Have you ever heard the expression free love? Do you know what it means? It means false love. True love does not want to be free. It wants to bind itself. It wants to give everything and forever. It wants to make a vow, a promise that it will keep. G.K. Chesterton says the man who makes a vow makes an appointment with himself at some distant time or place. The question is, will he keep the vow? That's the adventure. The perils and the punishment must be real. If I bet, I must be made to pay, or there's no poetry in betting. If I challenge, I must be made to fight, or there's no poetry in challenging. And if I vow to be faithful, I must be cursed when I'm unfaithful or there's no fun in vowing. Want more than a minute? Chesterton.org Welcome back to Face to Face with the Institute of Catholic Culture. I'm Father Hezekiah Carnazzo, joined by Annie Mitchell and Dr. Kenneth Howell. Doctor, I apologize. I totally cut you off a minute ago just before we went to our hard break there. But, uh, but, but I'd like you to continue your thought there. And my question was, um, if, if what happens on the altar with bread and the transformation of the consecration of that bread into the body and blood of Jesus takes place on the altar with, with bread, what does that mean for us who receive it? How are we to be transformed? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's three church fathers that uh, immediately come to mind as dealing with this. St. Peter of Ravenna in the early 5th century, he was a younger contemporary of St. Augustine, um, he actually talks about this, and I wrote an article about it. It, uh, What he says is, he's talking about the woman, you know, in Mark chapter 5, who comes and touches the hem of Jesus' garment and is healed. And, you know, everybody's, everybody is astounded that he pays attention to this woman because it says he, the power went out from him. Now, St. Peter Chrysologus says, you touched Jesus in the Eucharist. Why are you not healed of your sins? And so this is the puzzle that the church fathers, if, if we're receiving the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who's the healer of our souls, why are we so easily go back into sin? Mm. Why do we have so many problems in our lives? Well, another one is St. Augustine in the Confessions. This is in Book 7, Chapter 10. He, you know, he talks about, you know, rise up and grow, and you will not transform me into you the way normal you know, physical food does, but you, that is Christian, you Christian, will be transformed into me. And St. John Chrysostom in the East has the same uh, puzzlement that he sees in his people and his congregation. He talks particularly about the men who go to the theaters and see these risque shows and so forth. Um, you know, here they're professing Christians and they come and they receive the sacrament, but they, it doesn't seem to change their lives. This is the paradox of being Christian. Why do I have all this grace flowing in me, and I still have such a hard time? Well, there is no real answer to that, except that we have to persevere on our side, and God, in his love, in his philanthropia, um, perseveres with us, 
and you will bring us mm-hmm. you know, to eternal life. Uh, we have to hang in there and not let our own sins and our failings, you know, uh, so discourage us that we give up. Mm. You know, I was just, I was, uh, had, had on my list the question regarding Judas, um, and that's on that same point about, yeah. about, um, you know, Judas there comes to the Last Supper to receive the Eucharist, and clearly the grace offered to him uh, was, was, was spoiled, you know, by his own actions. So clearly we have a role to play. I guess this is related in a similar way to the fact that we are divinized in our baptism, right? We're born again. We're made sons in the Son. And yet yeah. the Eucharist continues to give us that same gift throughout our life as we kind of, as you're saying, as we stumble, we fall away, we come back to the Lord. The Lord is always there offering the gift of his love to us. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so true. And it's interesting that you should bring up Judas. And again, I don't want to just focus exclusively on St. John Chrysostom, but you know, for the last couple of years I've been translating and reading and, and writing this book on him. And he has two homilies on Judas. The one that strikes me the most interesting is that he says Judas came and took this, took the Eucharist, as you said, and then and uh, why did why did he then turn away? Jesus was giving him the opportunity to repent of his intended evil that he was going to commit, and Saint John Chrysostom says, "Don't weep for Jesus. Weep for Judas." Don't weep for those who suffer evil. It's far worse to commit evil. Mm-hmm. And so he says, weep for, weep for those who commit evil. And that's Judas. So, you know, this is the heart of a truly person transformed by grace, that we look out of the world and we feel the, the, the pain of the world's sin. And Boy, there's a lot of that going on out there in our world in America today, isn't it? So <laughs> we got a lot to... Oh, yeah. So we can, we can weep for all of the all of the evil and the sin that's out there in the world and pray that God will bring conversion. And maybe it's because of my age or whatever, but I've just just come to the point where I realize, you know, there's not much hope for us in this country without people coming to Christ mm. and his church. And that's, of course, going to begin with, uh, with me, my own conversion. You know, as, as I approach yeah. the, Holy, the Holy Eucharist, I think in a similar way, we stand like Adam before the fall. And all of us yeah. are given a choice to, co- to come and to receive the gift uh, that God has prepared for us. Or like Judas, take what is not ours to take. There's a, a, a beautiful tradition in the Christian East. We don't speak of taking communion. And we never speak of taking communion. Judas took communion. No, we receive uh, communion. Yeah, We receive yeah, the gift. Point. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, But yeah, each one of us, Doctor, yeah, like whether it's Judas or whether it's whoever it might be, and myself included, every time I approach the Holy Mysteries, I stand like Adam before yeah. the fall. And the Lord gives me a choice. It yeah. allows me the freedom to make a choice, to either receive yeah. in obedience or, to, or to, to take in disobedience and therefore cause my own fall and ultimately my death. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Boy. If I uh, want to invite people to if want to dive deeper into this subject to learn more from Dr. Howell, I encourage you to check out uh, our show notes on iccradio.org where you can find uh, really a ton of links related to today's topic. Of course, our whole faith kind of centers around today's topic in the Eucharist. Um, and I'd also encourage you uh, to click the Learn More button uh, and join our ICC family if you haven't already. Again, we're going to link a number of Dr. Kenneth Howell's talks uh, there, including his talk on the Eucharist. So, Doctor, I just want to take a moment to say thank you for being with us today. We really appreciate your insights. Thank you, Father. I really enjoyed it. And may God bless the work you're doing. It's just wonderful. Thank you, Doctor. We look forward to having you on again. We have more than a, a, a thou- oh, well over a thousand hours. Annie, I think we're getting close to maybe fifteen hundred hours or more of no free on-demand education at the, at the institute. Yeah, mm-hmm. and if you would like to participate in a few live events that are coming up soon, uh, we have Doctor John Cutterback, who was the guest last week on uh on face to face he will be speaking on june 13th on saint joseph a biblical reflection on saint joseph that'll be at 7 p.m eastern time 6 p.m central at the institute of catholic culture and also looking forward to seeing christopher check 
on June 15th, talk about Charles the Great and the Holy Roman Empire. That's a Tuesday, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central. And you can find links to register to both of those talks at iccradio.org. Annie, Annie how, much, how much do these programs cost to get on and learn from, from these great teachers? That would be zero. Nothing. Free Nada. of it is charge. Free. My brothers and sisters, I want to invite you to come check out Institute of Catholic Culture.org. Every week we do a Sunday gospel reflection, an hour-long Bible study going through the biblical text there uh, in preparation so you can get yourself ready for the coming Sunday. We've got live programs going on all the time. We're going to be opening up, I do believe, Annie, very shortly, our registration for philosophy mm-hmm. uh, with Dr. John Cutterback on uh, human nature. Um, and uh, our understanding of reality. For those that have not studied with Dr. Cutterback before, he is absolutely fantastic. He's one of my mentors, and, um, and we're going to be opening up a semester-long course with him in philosophy. Again, everything free of charge. Annie, I think they can register there at iccradio.org, uh, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you can find the link to that as well. I will put that up. And I believe registration opens on June 10th for Philosophy 102. I have been in Philosophy 101 with Dr. Cutterback. And I mean, I think there are, what, a thousand people, 800 people maybe that are that are taking this class. Yeah, regular right attendees, now. over about 1,600 yeah. registered from over 40 countries. And Dr. Cutterback has like a thousand new disciples because of this class. He's incredible, and it's such a gift that the ICC has given to us in in giving him to to the masses for free. You, for you know, free. Annie, the the work of Jesus Christ is given to us freely. I know there's a lot of people out there selling the the gospel, you know, packaging up this new Bible or that new Bible or this new program or that new program. We got to get back to the program of Jesus Christ and what we've received freely, we have to give freely. That's the mission at the Institute of Catholic Culture, and it's the same mission at the Guadalupe Radio Network, and that is to share the gift of Christ at anyone for anyone who's thirsty for the truth. And I'm telling you, everyone's thirsty for the truth, whether they realize or not, because that thirst is in place as a seed in our heart. Um, and uh, I want to encourage everybody in your support for the Guadalupe Radio Network. We're not going to be uh, on next week with our face-to-face program because GRN is holding uh, their share uh, And this is a beautiful opportunity to, to support a real Christian mission, a mission which seeks to give freely what Christ has given us freely. It's the same mission we have at the Institute of Catholic Culture. I encourage you to support Guadalupe Radio Network and, uh, and come and check us out at instituteofcatholicculture.org. Again, we're going to be live on June 13th at 7 p.m. with Dr. John Cudabat. Go to Joseph. Check us out, instituteofcatholicculture.org. And we'll be back with you then in two weeks' time for Face to Face with the ICC. Father Hezekiah and Andy Mitchell, God bless you all on this beautiful feast day. Sorry about that. All right, we're guys. off the air in Houston now, so uh, awesome. we're good to go. Wow. Thank you, guys. Yeah, 